Hello friends, I am Arpit and I am here with today's analysis. Today is 17th of September and also happens to be the Vishwakarma Jayanti. Now as promised by our Prime Minister in his Independence Day speech, he has launched a PM Vishwakarma Yojana today. And that is going to be our first topic for discussion, that is PM Vishwakarma. It is a scheme for those people who use tools to accomplish their work. They can be construction workers, masons, you know, carpenters or, you know, barbers, beauticians. The government has identified 18 categories of people and the government will be supporting them financially for their work. The government will be giving them incentives for buying their toolkits. Government will be giving them a collateral free loan in two, two tranches. First tranche of 1 lakh rupees, second tranche of 2 lakh rupees. But one shortcoming which as of now we are seeing in this particular scheme is that the government has not talked about providing social security net to them in this scheme. So as of now as per the details available these have not been mentioned in the scheme as yet. So we can call it one of the shortcomings of this scheme. Then the next topic which we are going to cover is GM crops, genetically modified crops. Now, do we use or do we produce GM crops in India? Actually, there is only one crop which is available for commercial cultivation. That is a GM crop that is BT cotton only. That too, it is not edible. Yes, GM mustard is waiting for approval of the Ministry of Environment and Forest and Climate Change for approval that, you know, if... M, M, you know, members of Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change approve, then GM mustard will be the second crop available for commercial cultivation. All the research work has been done, field trials have been done. There is one body named as Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee, which is under the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. That body has sent to the Ministry officials for approval, but approval is yet pending. But the significance of genetically modified crops in a world where climate change is happening, where agricultural productivity is drowning, in a world where nutritional standards are not met, there is hunger, there is malnutrition, all these kind of problems can be tackled by GM crops. But these GM crops also have certain, you know, challenges attached with it. What are these challenges? How, what all can GM crops do, how it can benefit us, we'll see in this particular topic. And finally, the last topic which we are going to do is the Jal Jeevan mission. We've talked about it earlier, but we've not covered it in detail. Uh, this Jal Jeevan mission aims to provide every rural household, rural household is the keyword, every rural household by a functional household tap connection. Functional household tap connection, FHTC, is nothing but a tap from which water will come. How much water will come? 55 liters of water per person per day. This is the actual aim of this Jal Jeevan mission. Here in this topic, we will be assessing its performance, how it has performed since it was launched way back in 2019. And obviously, there are some challenges also in implementation. We'll look into those challenges as well. So let us begin with the first topic that is PM Vishwakarma Yojana. Now on this occasion of Vishwakarma Jayanti, the Prime Minister of India, as promised by him, in his Independence Day speech has launched this particular scheme. The scheme aims to not only financially benefit the artisans, the masons, the construction workers or barbers. Government has identified 18 categories of beneficiaries. So this scheme not only aims to, you know, financially benefit them, but it also aims to, you know, continue the tradition, the heritage, the work which, which their previous generations were doing, so they should also be doing that work. The need is financial push. The financial push is given by the PM Vishwakarma Yojana. However, one shortcoming of this Yojana is that the government has not talked about, you know, 
social security net for these people. These people, many of them or majority of them are out of the social security net. Social security which comprises of pension facilities or insurance facilities or paid leaves, things like these. So that component is missing. The total outlay for this program or for the scheme is around 13,000 crore rupees, 100% funded by the central government. The government will be funding this particular amount for various purposes, like these people who use toolkits, the so government will provide incentives for toolkits. Government will also provide collateral free loans, the first tranche 1 lakh rupees, the second tranche 2 lakh rupees, interest rate of 5% which will you know be benefited or supplemented by number of digital transactions they do now this is similar to pm swanidhi there also extra benefits are given to the street vendors if they do the required or the the, the set target if they complete for digital transactions means whatever work they are doing they are receiving money digitally in their bank account here also for these you know people who are using tools to do their work, to accomplish their work, they are receiving money in their bank account, they will be supplemented. So this is the PM Vishwakarma Yojana launched on the Vishwakarma Jayanti that is today 17th of September. So let's see the details. On the occasion of Vishwakarma Jayanti, Prime Minister Shri Narendra Modi launched a new scheme, PM Vishwakarma, 17th September that is today. It has been sustained focus of the Prime Minister to give support to the people engaged in traditional crafts. Traditional crafts are basically, you know, many people across the country, they are engaged in this sector, but this sector is not becoming financially viable. During the Britishers, if I talk about this particular sector, this particular sector was very much impacted, very much impacted by the finished products made in the factories of the Britishers or the Europeans. So, they were impacted badly, but they anyhow sustained their activities. In independent India, also they sustained their activities, but this sector is not becoming financially viable too much. So, in order to help them, to give them a push, we have launched this particular Yojana. This focus is driven by the desire to not only support the artisans and craftspeople financially, but also to keep the age-old tradition, culture and diverse heritage alive and flourishing through local products, art and crafts. So this is the main focus of this particular scheme. About the scheme, 13,000 crore rupees will be the allocation for this scheme. Fully funded by the union government, states have no role to play. Another scheme, Vishwakarmas, will be registered free of charge on this Vishwakarma portal. Vishwakarmas are those people who are you know, the artisans, the 18 categories of people, which we'll see, those are called as Vishwakarmas. The scheme aims to strengthen the, and nurture the Guru Shishya Parampara or family-based practice of traditional skills by Vishwakarmas, improving the quality as well as the reach of products and services of artisans and craftspeople. So this is the financials. They will be provided or they, recognition through PM Vishwakarma certificate. This certificate will be provided to them and an ID card will be provided. How it will be provided? They will have to register themselves on the Vishwakarma portal. And after verification, this PM Vishwakarma certificate or ID card will be provided to them. Now they'll be eligible for benefits. Skill upgradation will be done for them. This is free of cost. They'll not have to pay anything. Toolkit incentives, because these people use tools, 15,000 rupees as toolkit incentive will be given to them. Collateral free credit means they do not have to put anything as collateral for getting access to this credit. And the first tranche of credit is 1 lakh rupees. If they repay it in the stipulated time period, then they will be eligible for second tranche that is 2 lakh rupees at a concessional interest rate of 5%. That too also will be reduced because they will be incentivized for digital transactions and marketing support will be given to them. So if they, whatever, let's suppose there is an electrician or there is a carpenter doing or making furniture somewhere or making anything somewhere. So first he'll be getting, you know, 
toolkit incentives he can buy tools from this money and his first step is he'll be, he'll, he'll register himself on his port on this portal then he'll get toolkit incentive of 15000 rupees then if he wants loan so 1 lakh rupees loan will be given to him he repays that loan well within time and during after taking this loan whatever work he does he is taking money in directly in his bank account so he'll get further incentives some some like interest rate can be reduced cashbacks can be given by the government like this the same it is there in pm swanidhi also then rupees 2 lakh will be the second tranche if he wants after repaying this 1 lakh rupees if he wants the second tranche he can take loan from that second tranche also who are beneficiaries actually you know first we need to understand beneficiaries can be in rural and urban areas it is not like only urban areas or only rural areas both it is there 18 traditional crafts are there carpenter boat maker armorer blacksmith hammer and tool kit maker locksmith goldsmith potter sculptor or stone breaker cobbler mason raj mistri we call it basket mat broom maker doll and toy maker barber garland maker washerman tailor and fishing net makers these are 18 categories of people which have been identified in this particular scheme upsc can go at length and ask you a question in prelims which of the following categories is are eligible for benefits under the pm vishwakarma yojana so don't memorize it by heart but yes read it again and again so you'll you'll get to know acha this is there this is not there this is there this is not there like this so this is all about pm vishwakarma yojana one shot coming of pm vishwakarma yojana is the government has as of now there are no details in public domain from wherever i got this i got this from pib actually there are no details about you know social security benefits to the vishwakarmas these are all the vishwakarmas for them there is no you know availability of social security net genetically modified crops genetically modified crops are crops whose genes have been modified why they have been modified because you know to get the desired result in the seed of the plant there is that nucleus in the nucleus there is the dna inside the dna there are genes due to modification of these genes how modification can be done by introducing a foreign gene by introducing a gene from another variety of that crop and by this introduction of this gene a foreign gene or a transgenic gene the desired results are met an example in this context can be bt cotton bt in bt cotton stands for bacillus thuringiensis it is the name of a bacteria which is found in the soil where the cotton grows cotton grows in black soil so there is this bacteria in that soil bacillus thuringiensis so the scientists took out a gene of that particular bacteria bacillus thuringiensis and inserted it in the cotton genes now by the insertion of that cotton genes the cotton came to be known as bt cotton what was the desired result why did we do it we did it because these cotton plants earlier were eaten by a pest called as pink bollworm as a result productivity of cotton went down but now you know this bt cotton when it grew out of that genetically modified seed pink bollworm came ate it then that particular genetically modified crop created an acidic medium in the stomach of pink bollworm which led to the death of pink bollworm slowly and gradually the pink bollworms evolved in such a way that they do not consume or they do not come near the cotton crop now as a result productivity of cotton crop has gone up this is the benefit of genetically modified crops having said that you know 
these crops have also a lot of challenges challenges like we do not know in the future how this genetic modification is going to have an impact on the local ecology it can be an ecological disaster also when transmutations mutations will happen it can lead to ecological disasters so we need ample field trials to you know accomplish this there are many 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 genetic modified crops being used cultivated many in many countries of the world but in india as of now for commercial cultivation we only have gm or i would say bt cotton bt cotton is a genetically modified cotton genetically modified mustard has completed its field trials the genetic engineering appraisal committee which is a body under ministry of environment forest and climate change has sent it for approval to the ministry approval is pending and yehens you know the commercial cultivation of genetically modified mustard is pending what is the desired result over there the desired result over there in genetically modified mustard is to increase the productivity of mustard mustard is an oil seed and in india you know sarso ka tel which we make is is a mustard oil consumption is huge but the productivity per hectare of mustard is very low so this aims this genetic modification aims at increasing productivity many herbicides will not be used in genetically modified mustard the name of that mustard is dmh dhara mustard hybrid or dhm dhara hybrid mustard we call it so this is about genetically modified crops the adoption of science based technologies for crop improvement genetic engineering for developing genetically modified crops as a supplement to conventional breeding methods has become absolute necessity now why they have become an absolute necessity because we are suffering from various problems like hunger poverty malnutrition on one side on the other side climate change climate change is inducing lot of heat waves so what if we modify the seeds of a particular crop and those crops become resistant to heat waves they'll not get spoiled what if we modify the genes in such a way that they become resistant to less water because in climate change less water is you know is availability of water is becoming a challenge so in these two scenarios genetic modification has become a necessity according to the global food security and nutrition report of 2019 it is difficult to achieve zero hunger target by 2030 this is sdg 2 we have to achieve this target by 2030 but you know due to these challenges climate change and all this is difficult to meet but genetic modification can do the trick for us then when we talk about gm mustard then genetic engineering appraisal committee GEAC is a body under Ministry of Environment Forest and Climate Change what does GEAC do it basically gives approval for clinical trials let's suppose i am a scientist i have developed a genetic modification or genetically modified variety of any crop i go to GEAC sir i have developed this so GEAC will examine it and GEAC will give me approval for clinical trials or field trials acha you do field trials will assess the findings of that field trials and these field trials continue for multiple years now field trials for uh, this genetically modified mustard they are continuing from 2013 14 in 2017 the results of clinical trials were submitted to GEAC now this has been developed by delhi university a professor in delhi Uni university south campus has developed gm mustard so that professor submitted his results to the GEAC in 2017 GEAC further gave it approval and sent it to the ministry officials for approval for commercial cultivation ministry official said no not now you need to do more trials so more trials were done after that so genetic engineering appraisal committee is kind of a facilitator between the innovators those who have done the innovation in this case the professor in delhi university and the ministry 
This GEAC will facilitate clinical trials, give approvals for various other administrative hurdles. And then the findings of by GEAC will be submitted to the ministry officials. It is then dependent on ministry officials whether to approve it or disapprove it. It is in their prerogative. GEAC functions in Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. It is responsible for appraisal of activities involving large scale use of asadus microorganisms and recombinants in research and industrial production. It is also responsible for appraisal of proposals relating to release of genetically engineering or genetically engineered organisms or genetically modified organisms. Now history of GM mustard as I already told you in 2017 GEAC had cleared the proposal for commercial cultivation of GM mustard. However, Union Environment Ministry vetoed it and suggested that the panel hold more studies on GM crops. So more studies were held after 2017 and now again the professor has submitted the findings of these trials to GEAC. GEAC has forwarded that to the ministry. Approval is still pending. Genetic modification or engineering aims to transcend the genus barrier by introducing an alien gene in the seeds to get the desired effect. Now alien gene like in case of cotton. The gene inserted is that of a bacteria Bacillus thuringiensis, which is found in the soil where cotton is grown. That is an alien gene. Alien gene is inserted. Then BT cotton is this Bacillus thuringiensis. It allows the crop to develop a protein toxic, toxic to the common pest that is pink bollworm. That protein is toxic to this pink bollworm as I told you that it creates an acidic medium in the stomach of pink bollworm which leads to the pink, bollworm, pink bollworm's demise. Slowly, slowly and gradually the pink bollworms have you know evolved in such a way that they are not now coming and consuming the cotton crop. Seeds produced using genetic engineering are called as genetically modified seeds. Now as I told you that only BT cotton is for commercial cultivation in India. GM mustard can be the second crop if ministry approves it but research is going on on many products on many agricultural I would say commodities like rice, wheat, cotton is already there, eggplant, maize, mustard, soya bean, chickpea, groundnut, sorghum. Out of which you know cotton done available for commercial cultivation, mustard second such crop rest research is going on. So this is the present situation. Many times aspirants feel ki bhai BT Brinjal, they heard about BT Brinjal. BT Brinjal's research is going on, not available for commercial cultivation. Only cotton is available for commercial cultivation in India. No advantages of GM crops, if I told you, increase productivity and prevent crop loss. It happened in the case of cotton, when the pink bollworm stopped coming and consuming that cotton plant. So crop loss was reduced, productivity automatically increased. Then food security. At times, you know, genetic modification is done to increase the nutritional content of that particular crop. So let's suppose earlier you need to consume 100 grams of rice for having, let's suppose 10 grams of or 5 grams of carbohydrates. 5 grams of carbohydrates from 100 grams of rice. Now, genetic modification is done on the rice seed. Now, the same 100 grams of rice will give you 15 or 20 grams of carbohydrates. As a result, you will you will have to consume less. So, even if productivity is less due to climate change and all, nutritional requirements are met because of you know nutritional enhancements, fortification of that product, and less consumption will also do or will also be sufficient. Then enhanced nutritional quality is same like this, which I just explained. Maintain soil fertility. Now in case of BT cotton, if I talk about, we stopped applying any pesticide because pest was pink bollworm for which we used to earlier apply pesticide. Appli application of pesticides actually destroyed or hampered the soil fertility. Now 
this impact on the soil fertility by application of fertilizers is now no longer happening because we are not applying for pesticides because the genetic modification is taking care of the pests which were coming and eating it this is very simple this will maintain soil fertility but the challenges which i have been talking about there are some challenges with respect to the genetic modification first is bio safety of humans and animal health we actually do not know how this genetic modification will impact the health of humans in the longer run in india as of now edible you know crops genetic modification is not there but when in in many countries like in america gm corn is there so they are consuming corn so we do not know how this will impact and that corn gm corn corn is also consumed by the livestock over there as livestock feed like horses and all they consume that so we do not know how how or how it is going to impact the health their health in the longer run it can be possibility that as of now in the present times we are no, we are seeing no impact but in the longer run there can be impacts environmental concerns how the environment of that particular crop where it is sown how it will be you know impacted so it can create you know super weeds let's suppose genetic modified crops are growing we have done some you know alterations in the natural processes that is not natural we have altered the natural processes and that small or bit alteration of the natural processes can create lot of i would say problems in the nearby area it can impact it ecologically so let's suppose we are growing a gm crop there is pollination cross pollination happens and a cross pollination between a gm crop and a non gm crop we don't know how that is going to work and if let's suppose that leads to super weeds the so super weeds will destroy the crop so instead of increasing the productivity productivity gets decreased because that undesired super weeds they are of no use they grow they consume the area or they consume a lot of water leaving less water for them so that can be catastrophic also economic concerns we have this notion ki bhai gm crops they will lead to increase in farmers income they have also led to increase in farmers income but it was expected to be here but actually it is here so this is an economic concern that despite doing or despite taking such a risk gm crops genetically modifying it altering with the natural processes the income has not met the desired result that is actually an economic concern then ecological concern genetically modified crops in the longer run can create ecological concerns like they consume a lot of water and leaving less water for the nearby vegetation that can be an ecological concern you can you do not get to know it immediately but in the longer run if it happens it can be there it can be a cause so these are some challenges with respect to the gm crops that is why the government of india is quite cautious in taking steps for this you say anything this is good this is better it can increase the nutritional content it can increase productivity yes it can but the underlying factor is that you are altering a natural process if it becomes successful there are some ethical concerns also with respect to this because you know humans who are altering with the genes can also look to alter the genes among humans also although that is a banned activity in india and all across the world human cloning we call it that is banned genetic modification among humans is banned per se but some diseases are getting cured by it so for that purpose you know it is allowed but it can be unethical as well so these are the challenges attached with genetic modification of crops way forward there should be awareness and information among the people among the farmers government road map should be clear that we should do this clinical trials this much amount this much area everything should be clear so that the researchers also get the confidence 
capacity building for research and development the government should be supporting more and more research and development so that this modification or this i would say engineering in the genes actually turns out to be fruitful for us and not harmful for us so capacity building will help it and robust clinical trials clinical trials should be very very robust there should be a proper standard operating procedure also set for that now by taking these steps we can make genetic modification or genetic engineering in favor of us so innovation research and development can definitely help us become a zero hunger society by 2030 the jal jeevan mission jal jeevan mission is a mission which aims at providing functional household tap connections in every rural household and not only functional household tap connection but water also from that functional household tap connection how much water 55 liters of water per person per day should be available now this is the demand side we are talking about that 55 liters of per water per person per day but the jal jeevan mission also envisages to motivate the people to meet the supply side also we should remember that this jal jeevan mission is targeting the rural households we have to cover all the rural households by 2024 with a functional household tap connection giving 55 liters of water per person per day so in rural areas there are various other schemes like mg narega and all which are also going so we can include the people in creating ponds artificial ponds water reservoirs water will be restored in that and that water only will be available in the form of 55 liters of water per person per day so people who are demanding that water should also be working for the supply of that water by creating that physical infrastructure for water conservation people should also be motivated to save and conserve water to judiciously use water this is the jal jeevan mission how it is performing there are both view points you know many states around 5 6 states in india like punjab haryana gujarat goa telangana they have uh, you know achieved 100% coverage means the rural areas in these all the states have 100% coverage of functional household tap connections many union territories like andaman nicobar island puducherry or daman and diu dadra and nagar haveli that also 100% coverage is there some states like himachal pradesh bihar more than 90% coverage is there and in the times to come 100% can be there but does the coverage 100% coverage or 90% coverage which we talked about means that water is being supplied or that much water is being supplied that is actually a challenge which this particular mission is facing in some households tap connections are not there only pipelines are there in other households where tap connections are there water is not coming water is only coming for 2 hours in a day so these are the challenges the quality of water is also a big question which is coming these are i would say the lacunas in implementation of the scheme but still we have one year left and let's see how this performs how this scheme performs so let us look into the details the jal jeevan mission aims for providing piped drinking water to all rural households by 2024 this should be remembered rural households the jal shakti ministry is the nodal ministry for implementation the jal jeevan mission envisages supply of 55 liters of water per person per day to every rural household through functional household tap connection by 2024 jjm focuses on integrated demand and supply side management demand so is this 55 liters of water per day but supply side as i told you that the people who are demanding this should also be working for you know managing the supply side how they will be working i gave you an example by creating water reservoirs they'll also be earning money for creating that water reservoirs under mg narega so that should be met jjm looks to create a jan andolan for water making it everyone's priority 
funding pattern of this scheme the center and the states both contribute 90 10 for himalayan and northeastern states 90 obviously is of the central government and state government contributes 10 percent 50 50 for other states and 100 percent for union territories the total allocation for this is rupees 3 lakh crore this is a huge amount so let's see how it turns out to be by next year now implementation how the implementation of the scheme happens there is you know pani samitis which are formed in every you know village area what does these pani samitis do they implement manage operate and maintain village water supply systems there will be 10 to 15 members in this pani samiti with at least 50 percent women members this is actually very good because you know due to lack of availability of water it is the women who are actually struggling who actually struggle because it is the women who travel that distance to collect water come back with that water many problems they face many health issues they face sexual abuse also happens so it is actually a very novel step that in these pani samitis 50 percent members should be women members and if these people who are at the receiving end of due to lack of water they are there in the pani samitis they will definitely take some steps to eradicate this problem other members from self-help groups asha that is accredited social and health workers anganwadi teachers etc will be there among these 10 to 15 members the committees prepare a one-time village action plan merging all available village resources the plan is approved in a gram sabha before implementation of this plan so this is how the implementation will happen now we're talking about performance of the scheme currently about 12.3 crore households that is 62 percent of rural households have piped water connections from 3.2 crores in 2019 so this is a major major leap 3.2 crore 12.3 crore 16.6 percent earlier it was there 62 percent now one year is left 38 percent has to be met five states gujarat telangana goa haryana and punjab as i mentioned earlier and three union territories andaman nicobar islands daman Diu, and dadra nagar haveli and puducherry have reported 100 percent coverage that means that in these uts and states 100 percent of the rural households are having a functional household tap connection receiving 55 liters of water per person per day receiving this much water is a big question but having a tap connection it can be a possibility himachal pradesh at 98.87 followed by bihar at 96.30 are also poised to achieve the saturation in the near future means they are also expected to achieve this 100 percent in the near future shortcomings of this particular scheme because you know it is definitely not perfect so let us see even in villages officially certified as having 100 percent coverage of functional household tap connections many households do not have taps some do have taps but are not getting any water through them even in the best case scenario such households get no more than two hours of water in a day Many households are not connected with pipes as of now and quality of water supply in those households is also an issue right now. Let's be hopeful. It is very important to be hopeful that by the next year, these shortcomings, it will be fulfilled. Because if we are doing such a big, I would say we are taking such a big step, there will be shortcomings. Let's be practical also. But our you know approach as civil servants or our approach as civil services aspirants also should be for finding the solutions to those shortcomings so this is why i have highlighted these shortcomings i've also told a shortcoming in pm vishwakarma so how can these be fulfilled your focus should be that now as our prime minister says that you should be a solution giver a solution provider not a solution not a problem creator so this is it from today's session i will be meeting you with some very important news pieces tomorrow onwards and you know i am also planning to discuss the main papers the answers to some of the questions which are very very important 
how to from how to approach these kind of questions i will be starting with such kind of a series in the times to come till then keep studying keep reading keep writing and most importantly keep revising namaste jai hind take care